Hi everyone and welcome to the webinar Laughing Through Life and Other Catastrophes with Adam Bigham. This is the St Kilda Film Festival 2020 Big Picture Professional Development Session, proudly presented in association with the Sunshine Short Film Festival and Cine Space. My name is Ra Chapman, I'm a writer and actor and it's my pleasure to be your host today. Okay, before we get started, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which this festival is hosted, the Boonarong peoples of the Kulin Nation, and pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the traditional owners from the country you may be watching this from. As most of you know, the 2020 St Kilda Film Festival is nationally online for the very first time. The festival is proudly produced by the City of Port Phillip and supported by government partners, Screen Australia and Film Victoria. We thank them and all the sponsors and participating industry and filmmakers. And we thank you, the audience, for joining us today. Please watch as many things as you can and make the most of these wonderful free opportunities. And now for a quick bit of housekeeping. All film festival content is available to view for free from the website. This session will be recorded and uploaded to the festival website tomorrow. So in case you miss any nuggets of gold today or you have to leave early, the content will be available to view until June 20th. And in regards to the length of today's workshop, please note that it will run for 90 minutes, an hour and a half, as opposed to the 60 minutes as originally advertised. And lastly, before I introduce Adam, I'll just talk quickly about how this session will run. Adam wants to make this workshop as interactive as possible, which is a tricky task due to us not being able to actually see or hear you but we really encourage you to ask questions as they arise for you during the session. Also, I believe there will be a section when Adam will open it up to everyone to brainstorm ideas together. So everyone at home, there is a Q and A box to the right of your screen where you can type any questions you have for Adam in response to the topics he's talking about. And I will do my best to keep track of the questions as they are posted and will interrupt Adam as smoothly as I can throughout the session and relay your questions. Apologies in advance if I miss your question or run out of time to ask it. We will do our best to leave some time at the end of this session where you can ask Adam any additional burning questions or questions I may have previously missed. Okay, time to get to the fun stuff and give, and give you a bit of a background about the presenter of this comedy writing workshop, Adam Bigham. Adam studied film and television production at Footscray City Films and professional screenwriting at RMIT. He started his stand-up comedy career as a raw national finalist and has won numerous awards as a stand-up comedian and perform shows at Melbourne International Comedy Festival and Melbourne Fringe Festival. The multi-talented Adam has produced two YouTube channels with over 1.5 million views and worked as production crew, video editor, producer and studio manager. He has been hired as a writer on many development workshops and has penned narrative pilot scripts for production companies. Adam started working for ABC Me as a producer for the series Stacked earlier this year, and as the lockdown happened, was appointed head writer of new ABC Me comedy series, Definitely Not News. Welcome, Adam, and handing it over to you. Thanks so much, Ra. Uh, first, I should check, can you hear me? All I good? can hear you. I'm Great. sure hopefully everyone else can do. <laughs> Perfect. Great. I didn't want to ramble on for five minutes only to not be heard. So it's um, very nice intro to, from you. Thank you very much. Um, and for anyone else who's uh, interested in what else I'm doing, uh, you can follow me. Um, I don't use social media. I just like to encourage stalkers. Um, I'm very lonely. Uh, no. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with a few of the silly little jokes as we go along. And uh, I can't hear any of you laugh, so I'm just going to have to assume I'm hilarious. But I can't hear any of you laugh, so it's just going to be exactly like 
my old stand-up days. So uh, on with the show. Now, um, Ra, I wanted to tell you something, actually. Um, you, your recent show at the Malthouse Theatre that, that was on, um, I had a friend move in next to the, to the Malthouse recently, and he was really excited of, to go see shows. And I'm not a, uh, a theatre goer by, by any means. I, uh, I'm, I'm more of a, a sitcom lover, um, a movie, that sort of thing. But yeah, theatre is not something that I've really gotten into. So he's trying to encourage me to go see some shows and I'm flicking through and just going like, nah, nah, nah. They were, they were a bit too, they seemed a bit too arty for me. And the, but the only one that I uh, was keen to see was, was yours. So I was really disappointed that it was, was oh. cancelled. But, um, and this will sort of help everyone sort of understand where my head's at is, um, like I, my brain is sort of wired to accessible comedy and sort of when I sort of saw that show, I'm like, okay, this is something that I don't need. It's not a arty fartsy sort of like theater show. This, this looks funny, you know, and that's sort of the, the brand of comedy that um, I'm going to be talking about today. Stuff that's really um, accessible. Um, now I should also give a warning at the top. Um, I am, I've mentioned this to you, uh, I'm suffering from a concussion at the moment. I'm uh, feeling pretty good today. I'm feeling pretty good the last few days, so shouldn't be a problem. But if I do lose my place, I'm going to rely on you, right, to sort of pick me up um, sure. wherever I was. But yeah, it should be fine because you know um, the the lockdown isolation. I wasn't restricting enough basic activities, so I thought, what else can I do um, to sort of you know, make my life more boring? So I went out and hit my head. Um, so this workshop, what I want it to be, is for people of all experience levels, um, no matter where you are, if you've you know, never made a film, if you've made a few films, maybe you've never seen a film, um, I can recommend them. They're really good, especially the ones with the explosions. Um, but really what I want to do is empower everyone to go out and actually make them, uh, make films instead of always saying you, you want to get into it, and but you might be putting it off for, for whatever reason. Um, because the world is a sort of bleak, very serious place at the moment and we all need to laugh um so that i think comedy is well needed right about now um and the two sort of broader lessons that i'm going to be talking about is not just comedy but also developing uh ideas for films specifically for festivals and how those two marry together um really well um so ra please intervene at any point to ask questions um to uh uh, forward on questions from the audience because I may miss them. Um, but if you've got any sort of ideas yourself, please um, jump in. Now, everyone's been forwarded the link to the uh, Scary Vampire. That was the, the short I made. And I'm going to use that quite a bit as a case example. Um, so I'll reference it quite a bit in terms of um, my process in, in approaching film ideas and scripting and that sort of thing. Um, so if, if you haven't seen it, it doesn't matter. Um, you can still follow the link that was attached to the description of this event and, and, and watch it afterwards. Um, but it is like, it's a good case example of just getting out there and making something. Um, it was something that uh, my friend, Dan Farmer, who I, who I directed it with, um, he found this film festival. He said, hey, do you want to enter it? I said, sure, looks great. Went to his house. We came up with the idea the night before. Um, I wrote the script in like 30 minutes and like we had no crew no trained actors um and we made it for like we spent about 35 dollars on it and it's since won about thirteen thousand dollars and won like 11 awards from across four festivals and but the, the out of those awards the one that i'm most proud about is um it w always wins the audience award and that's what i sort of that's the com the type of comedy that i like to encourage like um it's it's a crowd pleaser film it's a film that anyone can access and get into so that's what I want to encourage everyone to make today. Um, so how I've sort of structured this talk is to basically step through the process um, before you even have an idea to developing an idea and then eventually writing it. Um, so shall we start, Ra? What do you think? Is there any questions before we start? Has anyone said anything? No questions yet. It's just you and me. Can one person maybe just Say hello or something. Is it working? Is it? Is it? 
I have one hello so far. I, I would like another hello. Ah, oh, hello, hello. hey, Bree. Hey, Abigail. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. They're on. Sorry, guys. I, I just, I need that, that validation. I need the attention. <laughs> you know looking for this. That's great. Um, so I want to step through this, this process from start to finish. And so I'll use a, a fake sort of mock example. Of, and we're going to be talking about a filmmaker, a filmmaker who's never made um, a film before. So I'm just going to share my screen. All right. So you're getting that? All right. So we have our, oh, okay. Now I just noticed, Ra, we might have to sort of keep an eye on this. I noticed you've gone muted. So every time I share screen, that may happen to you. This might be a thing to keep an eye on. Can you hear me? Yep. Got you now. Cool. I mute myself. So good. <laughs> that may be, I'm going to go back and forth quite a bit. So that may happen a lot. Sure. Um, okay, great. So let's meet our hypothetical filmmaker. All right. There he is there. Now he um, does look um, a little bit like me, but he's not, I promise, um, because this guy's got a mustache and so he can't be me. I haven't even gone through puberty yet. So um, our hypothetical filmmaker needs a name. So what are we going to call him? Someone give us a suggestion. First name, last name. Come on, guys. Any names? I've got cutie. Oh, Doug. Yeah, that is definitely not true. Or they've said it ironically. <laughs> I've got Doug and John Cena. So. All right. This is Doug Cena. Okay. All right. So Doug, he's decided to uh, make a film. Now, when you are ap approaching sort of making a film, there's going to be people um, who are watching right now who have, who have some ideas banked like some really great ideas for films, but just what I want you to do today is just sort of put those aside. Um, I do it myself whenever I, I have like a, a Google share doc and um, I keep uh, all my ideas in a, in a, that I'm not sort of currently working on in a folder called on ice. And I just want people to do that today. Just put them in the freezer, come back to them at a later date. We want to clean uh, your slate of ideas. And this is going to help you sort of uh, better understand what I'm talking about today. So go back to that. All right. Now you're probably wondering, you know, why I'm using Microsoft Word. You know, Adam, why didn't you use PowerPoint? Don't you know that things made for presentations? Well, I'm a presenter maverick. Um, but no, I'm just using Microsoft Word today just so we can have it a little bit more, um, you know, so we can sort of play with things and write ideas down as a group together. So let's look at Doug's ideas. This is his current production slate. He's got a biopic about a person who invented the color beige, an experimental film entitled 23 Hours of Paint Drying, and my lower intestine and interpretive dance feature. So what we're going to do is we're going to delete all those and go into this with a blank slate. Now, what I want you to, to do, guys, is um, I think there's a, there's a good philosophy to have with your ideas and where you should get to with generating ideas is, is that you need to become an idea factory. I meet a lot of creatives who think they've got the next million dollar idea. Like this idea is it's, it's, you know, you'd be, everyone will be dumb not to purchase it. It's going to be so good is get out of that mentality. Um, the, the best writers that I work with, including the ones that I'm currently working with now, they don't value their ideas. They're just like they're a dime a dozen. And that's what, that's, it's the healthiest um, mentality to do, especially when writing comedy, is to um, become an idea factory. So what I next want to share is where I would start when I'm looking to make a new short film. And that is, don't find a festival for your film, create a film for a festival. That was, of course, said by some extraordinarily handsome guy. Um, now, what I mean by that is it is much more strategic to target a festival and base your idea around that. Um, have the festival inspire the idea. And when I look at festivals, I sort of like break them down into two broader groups. Um, you've got sort of your prestigious film festival and then 
what I call like a, a community film festival. And that's not knocking the community by calling the other one prestigious. They're just sort of um, they're very different, especially in terms of the crowds that they attract. So the, the film that we made was for a community festival. Um, it was targeting a local crowd and you, they're more akin to be like your, um, you know, so I, I was a stand up and stand up, you're trying to be broad because you, you're trying to speak to like your, your everyday punter and not so much like your, your artsy crowd. Um, so when you're doing that for the community festival, it's usually a lot easier to target a film festival because they'll have themes. Like we're looking for, you know, environmental films. We're looking for pride films or whatever it may be. The, the more prestigious festivals, they don't often do this. And often writing to a theme, it becomes a lot easier to then target that festival. So um, I'm not gonna be talking about these more prestigious festivals too much, like the one we're a part of now. Um, but if you are inclined to target those festivals, um, I think that the best strategy because they're not going to spell out exactly what they're looking for, the best strategy to do is basically just watch the, the previous winners of, of, of past years, see what they have in common, but also think about the demographic of that festival and what sort of films they're going to be interested in watching. Um, but also, I would encourage you to think about targeting um, the smaller festivals first, especially if you haven't um, won a film festival before, if you've never made a film, because you know, if I was going to learn guitar tomorrow, I'm not going to be thinking in a month's time, I'm going to win an aria. Like it just, you know, start small and then work your way up. Um, I remember when I was doing stand up, right? I don't know if you know, do you know of uh, Ronnie Cheng? Um, yeah, so he uh, was like a year ahead of me in stand up. He's, he's, his stand up is very like abrupt and serious, but he's like the nicest guy in the world. I remember like the best advice he ever gave me was um, perfect your five minutes, you know until you can do five minutes that smashes any room in the country that only until then do you move on to 10 minutes and i think it's a similar philosophy that you should have it's like once i win every single award at this festival i'll then move up to the more prestigious festival so that's what we did i'm just gonna share my screen again that was our approach to the film festival we made the film for this is the poster of last year's Sunshine Film Festival. And luckily this was a film festival where they really did spell out a whole range um, of things that they were looking for. So this is just the poster. The website also had some other information. And basically we looked through this and we said, okay, what sort of films are they looking for? And these were the five tick boxes that we, would, we tried to tick. So it's comedy, horror, family friendly. We thought that was sort of like the biggest challenge to do a horror film that was also family friendly. Um, and then also having a local flavor in there. The fifth one was multicultural ghost stories. We decided uh, not to do this, being uh, two white guys, probably wasn't appropriate to access um, multicultural stories of cultures we weren't a part of. So we decided not to do that one, but sort of focus in on the other four. Um, we even looked at the poster, because if you've seen the film, um, there's a vampire in it. And we said, well, the, the character in it could be anything. It could be a zombie, it could be a skeleton. So we were so obvious that we went, hey, let's just do a vampire because it's on the poster. So this is how much we targeted this, this film festival. Um, but also when you are targeting a, a film festival so specifically, you might be thinking, well, I don't wanna make a film that's just for one festival. Um, our film is then played at a, a whole bunch of others. So you'll, you'll find that too. Just use it as an instigator for the idea, um, but, you will, if it's great, you will have the chance to sort of um, share it amongst other festivals. You know, we also won uh, Peninsula Film Festival, the last one um, this year as well. So, and we, we didn't make it for that at all. You know, we made it for this and then won, won other ones. Um, so let's, as we go through this sort of a case example, um, this, this, I'm gonna come up with a fake festival, okay? That Doug is going to enter. So, oh, actually, this is one other thing before I mention that, that I want to talk about. Um, if you want to know different festivals that you can target that are out there, Film Freeway is a great resource. This didn't exist when I started making films. And when I discovered it recently, I'm like, this is the best thing ever. Um, there's film festivals all around the world. And once you go through, you'll see that a lot of them, smaller community festivals, um, 
they'll be themed and they have awesome prizes on offer. These are just some of the, the ones that I have noticed repeat. So if you were going to make a film for a specific themed festival, um, there's going to be another few dozen festivals you can also enter on the same theme. Um, environmental documentary, um, if you're a student, um, there's a lot of female only festivals that are out there as well. Um, outdoors is a really common one, things that involve animals, you know, so um, there's a lot of overlap in festivals, even if you decide to target one. Um, so what festival we're going to look at today? We're going to look at the St. Builder Festival. Okay, so the St. Builder Festival. Um, it's, a, it's a very obscure suburb of Melbourne. I'm not sure if any of you know it. Um, and the St. Builder Festival is themed on environmental films. Um, they're also looking for comedy films and they're looking for films that are less than five minutes. So that's going to be our fake film festival that we're all going to start brainstorming for in a moment. Now, I might just stop now and ask Ra, is there, has there any questions come through or? No, but I think that's because you're so clear I just, nice so far. <laughs> or I just won't shut up. Um, maybe that's a thing too. Um, feel free to ask questions as we, as we go, guys, but I'll try and get through this and leave some um, space at the end as well. So if there's any questions come through now, if not, I might keep going. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. Okay. So. That's sort of the, the first thing I want to discuss, um, targeting for a film festival. The next one I wanted to discuss is um, what I would call developing an idea with a producer's hat on. Um, and so I do this every day in writing for my current job, um, which is being mindful of the restrictions that you have before you start um, writing. And there's another share with you another little quote that some genius came up with, which is this. Invest in yourself, not in the film. That's the Dalai Lama. No, that's a lie. Okay, that was me. Um, this is a really important thing to invest in, your in yourself and not the film itself. Um, so, you know, our, our film was made for $35. That bought the silly vampire costume. I mean, we were lucky that uh, Dan, who I made it with, um, he works as a cinematographer, so he's got a lot of equipment. Um, we were lucky in that sense, but we just used a camera, a basic mic, and one light. Um, I'm convinced that film could have been shot on a phone um, and still done as, as well as it did. So, yeah, there's getting invested in an idea sort of convinces you that you have to sort of spend money on it. You've got to make it better, you know. Um, but you don't have to do that, not at all. Um, and one, when I say producing with, uh, sorry, writing with a producer's hat on is so that you don't get into a hole because, you know, if you just let yourself run free in terms of a development and scripting point of view, suddenly, you know, you, you, you get to the production point, and you're like, all right, now all we need is a tank, a snow covered mountain and a duck, you know, like, I don't know what film that would be, but I definitely want to see it. Um, and it's just to make sure you don't get to that point. So I think the best way to approach, um, before you even start thinking of an idea is just sort of outline the things that you have, what things can you access that are going to help you? So, you know, what, what gear do you have? Um, what do you have any sort of random props around that you think, and even props, things like props and costumes and locations you might be able to access. Um, they're really good in terms of um, inspiring an idea, you know, like, oh, I've got this weird costume. Maybe I'll use that and turn that as a basis of, of springboarding into a, a unique concept. Um, and I'll talk about uh, a bit about that later in terms of taking advantage of those things. Um, the other thing is to list who you have access to. You know, do you know any decent actors, um, any funny people, any comedians? Uh, editors, editors are like the, they're like diamonds in the creative industry. Like, like everyone wants to take advantage of them because editors that will work for you and work for nothing are very, very rare. Um, I recommend people learn to edit themselves. It's not hard. You could learn to be as skilled as a Hollywood editor from the tutorial little on YouTube. 
Um, there's so much free lessons out there. Um, so much easy applications, like you can edit on your phone. Um, you know, do you know any crew? Do you know anyone with a camera if you did want to avoid cheating on your phone? But I, again, I just want to re reiterate, um, not having anything shouldn't stop you. Because remember, we're investing in ourselves. And even if you make a terrible film, um, that's a lot better than making no film at all. So uh, a phone, you know, you've all got phones, all your phones are probably 4K. Uh, sound gear, sound is probably the most important thing, but um, they're very cheap. Like you can buy a little recorder for a hundred bucks. And if you don't have any actors, just do, you could do a stop motion animation. You could use children like we did. Um, you could use a dog. There's so many ways around making a film. You just have to think about how you're restricted and develop something with those restrictions. Um, because getting out there and starting to make things um, is the most important step. And so to reiterate that point, I keep losing my place on how to share screen. <clears throat> so let's look at our, our case example again. So Doug, um, he has a hundred dollars. He's got no camera. Um, he's only got a phone. He's only got a phone tripod, not even a real tripod. It's one of those little things, right? Um, so he's going to make shots by stacking boxes and sticking his little tripod on top. Doesn't have sound gear. Doesn't have sound gear. Um, he's going to use, doesn't have editing so software or an editor. So what he's going to do is use the Adobe free trial week. Don't tell Adobe I said that. Um, I actually know people who do this <laughs> I don't recommend it, but I know people who that they just keep signing up to like free trials and that's, they'll just keep editing like that. I've done um, that. I've done you don't? That. Okay. <laughs> you haven't? Your friend did that. Yeah, that sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Being recorded. My yeah. friend. <laughs> um, but you know, like a, a free trial week, that's probably the only time you need if you're making a, a two, three minute film. So um, that's what Doug's going to do. Um, and he's going to put himself in it because he's a massive attention seeker. Um, but he's got an old friend who's just started getting into stand up. So they're going to access that person as well. Um, and they've got no significant props or costumes, but some might spring to mind as we start um, developing. So the $100 that he's got there, I would spend that on uh, some sound gear just to. As soon as you can do some decent sound, it opens up possibilities of, of more ideas that you can accomplish. But we're not going to spend it yet because we're going to uh, brainstorm a few ideas and we're going to pick the best one. And we might spend the hundred dollars somewhere else. Um, I have a question. Sure. I me interrupting for a moment. Um, Abigail asks, as someone who is much more comfortable with visual storytelling and is not fantastic with words, are there any ways or places to find budding comedians and writers to collaborate with? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And that, that, I'm glad, um, was it Abigail? That's right. Abigail, I'm glad you asked that because um, that's why I, I put that he has, Doug has a hypothetical comedian friend because new creatives will do anything and they're so keen to do other stuff and new stuff and collaborate, you know? So it's more, it's just about making the leap of connecting with them. Um, and it's so much easier today that like, there's so many Facebook groups out there. Like, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure where you are, Abigail, I'm in Melbourne. Um, there's like comedians of Melbourne, there's uh, new actors of Melbourne, there's, there's all sorts of things. Um, so it's not too hard to connect with them. You also get a lot of people on things like Star Now looking to sort of build their um, showreel and stuff like that. So they're going to do new films and, and things. So um, yeah, just get out there and connect with people. And what you'll find is, and I've done this plenty of times, is you'll discover people who are just on the same level as, as you and you'll continue to use them and you know, you'll build relationships with them. Um, you sort of look back at all your content and it's just filled with the same people. That's happened um, to me before. Um, yeah, so it's more about just connecting with 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 other creatives. Yeah, they're, they're keen. <laughs> I think on that, the, um, for example, the Sunshine 
Film Festival, as well as Cine Space, um, and I'll give you their website details at the end. Even places like that are great organisations where you can, can connect with other writers as well. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yes. Mm. And you will, like, just by, you know, getting out and making stuff, you'll, you'll start to connect with other filmmakers. Um, at the Sunshine Film Festival, there was, there was a group of filmmakers and they were helping each other make films. I think there might have been a couple of directors, but they're all the same crew and all the same cast. And I think they had like three different films in, in, in the one event. And, you know, they've, their story might have been they met at a previous film festival or something like that. So you'll often find that, you know, people who are, who are keen, you, you'll meet them at, at these other festivals and, uh, and things. Yeah, so... Slightly harder with online festivals, but yeah. you no, know, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, but you know, maybe it's not impossible. Um, like so, the when before restrictions started to ease, um, my friend Dan, who I who I made the Stary Vampire with, and an actor friend who we we use a lot, we were uh, you know, when lockdown happened and everyone was like, oh my god, how long is it going to last? It's going to last for six months. Can't go outside of the house. So we immediately started developing something that could be made remotely. Um, and so, you know what, maybe there, there is ways to sort of do it from different locations. I know, um, what's the actor's name? Um, jo Joseph Gordon-Levitt. I'm not sure if it's still going. It might have died, I'm not sure. But he started a production company that was um, user contributed, where you would sign up as a member and people from all over the world would do different parts of the film. like. You know, so someone would edit it and someone else would write it and, and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, even, uh, yeah, borders and, and lockdowns don't stop people from collaborating. So there's a million ways to do it, yeah. Um, now, so yeah, uh, I just, there, has any more questions come through, Ra? Um, no, good for good. Oh, yeah. No worries, so yeah. Um, that, that's sort of just about just to sort of sum up is it's about um, thinking with the producer's hat and also to encourage you to be a tight ass, to be really a, a cheapskate like me. You know, if I was to give you a thousand dollars, don't spend that on one film. Like I would spend that on something that's going to elevate your filmmaking. That might be an Adobe subscription, that might be a camera, or it might be props to make 10 films or something like that. Um, later on, when we start brainstorming different ideas. Uh, if your best idea, if your favorite idea is gonna cost you like 500 bucks, but your second best idea is gonna be $400 cheaper, I would say make that one. Because you have no guarantees that your film is going to work. And I know that from experience, I've made many films which are terrible, that of course you think they're not going to be, but um, you can't predict where they're going to come apart because they rely on so many things to make them work. You know, it could fall apart of the script, the directing, the performances, the edit. You know, so many things have to work in its favor to work um, that I think it's just within your own professional development and personal interest to just, um, in, you know, spend as little money as possible just to sort of, you know, it feels like a gamble in a way. You know, I'd rather, if, if I have the same chance of this film being successful, I'd rather spend less on it. You know, you can buy a $1,000 a $1, lottery ticket or I can sell you one for 10 bucks. Um, yeah. So can I interrupt for a moment? I've yeah. just, I've found, I've just found there's two different ways people can contact me. So I've, just, I've just had a little look at another area here. Yeah. Um, just from Penelope. Um, um, about and this isn't actually really a question for you Adam I guess I'm just stating it mm. out there um, that just in regards to what is she written um, should clarify that you just can't go out there and explore um, um, using children and and babies I guess in your work and parent consent and all that which I'm sure Adam and I know that you had but I think she was just flagging for people um, 
and, and the safety officers are involved and there's agreements that should be made with MEAA rates and things like that. So I think she just kind of wanted to point out um, yeah. that that's something to be aware of, which is, is, is very true. Um, 100%. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I work for ABC Me. I know that better than anyone. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, like that, that's true. And when I said kids before, I meant your children. Don't go out and steal children. Don't you like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of boxes you have to tick if you if you're looking to employ um, child actors. Uh, LB in our film was um, Dan, the director's daughter, um, not a random girl I pulled off the street. So yeah, it's uh, that I, I probably should have um, made that clear. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that is a, a good point. And I've got another question um, from Lark. Um, can he ask, or they ask, how many film festivals um, did you submit your film to? Starry Vampire. Um, not many. So I was being very strategic in, um, in the festivals that I picked. So I was, I'll, I'll give you a story of when I was in film school. I, I think it was my third, we, we'd have to make a film every year. And the third film I made, I thought was the greatest thing ever. And I was so arrogant about it. And I just shot off to every film festival without understanding, you know, without being able to observe my film from an outside perspective and understanding the festival that I was entering it in. So I just like, just entered it off through everything. And guess what? Didn't get in anywhere. Um, and it's taken me a long time to sort of have that, I don't know, that being able to, to grow that outside perspective on your own work and being able to sort of um, judge it objectively. And so with it, I was specifically targeting festivals. Um, and it's hard to judge, you know, because I haven't been to these festivals in the world. So, but I was making sort of hunches about what the festivals were like and, and how they were marketing themselves. You know, so I was targeting, so for instance, our film is a community festival film it's a crowd pleaser, it's family friendly. So I was specifically looking for festivals that were outside as one thing, you know, like what, what outdoor festivals are that vibe, you know, like you go there with your family, you sit on a picnic blanket and that sort of thing. Um, so I was specifically looking for these sort of festivals. Um, how many do we enter? Like Film Freeway has uh, a lot of filters you can put in to search for stuff. And I probably went a bit crazy and just, you know, entering it into some free ones and random things that I didn't know, like they were, they were low risk because I didn't want to spend thousands of dollars on submission fees. Um, you know, but if it was a couple of bucks, I'd sort of just go, oh yeah, why not? But there was specific festivals I was going, ah, this one, I, I know it will play well at this one. Um, and then we were sort of halted by the lockdown. So when that happened, all the festivals that we were going to play at converted to online and um, which was a shame because our film, um, as I said, being a crowd pleaser and being in the audience of that, like it gets it gets a crowd going and then sort of being online, I was going to say, ah, it's, it, now it doesn't doesn't feel suited to it. Um, yeah, so we, we've sort of just, that's stopped us in our tracks and it stopped me entering in, in anything else. Um, we've sort of moved on to making the next thing. Yeah. And just one more um, quick one, um, and this is a very, technical specific one but yeah. do you know of any um of any good free editing software i don't use it myself um because adobe software is, is fairly industry standard um and i've used final cut before which is as well um yeah so i i'm more invested in using that because i use it for work but um i have looked into this before it always changes um i had someone ask me that years ago and it was as simple as Googling what is the best free software out there for, for editing. Um, but I would say use that software to upskill if you've never edited before. And then if you're getting into it, if you're starting to produce more content, then make the switch um, to Adobe. And if, you, if you're only invested, uh, interested in video editing with Adobe, you can get a much cheaper subscription if you're using one app, I'm pretty sure, rather than the whole suite. The whole suite is very expensive. 
Great, great. Well, um, I think there's in the Q and A's, other people are answering that question. So oh, great. I think have a drink. <laughs> Probably better than me too. <laughs> um, cool. So let's um, move on. Let's move on to brainstorming. So with our hypothetical filmmaker, Doug, we know he's in, uh, entering an environmental comedy film festival. Um, I sort of picked environmental randomly just because it's a common theme I see out there and I thought it's a topic that we could easily brainstorm within. So I'm going to share screen and I'll do it in a moment. So basically this brainstorming technique, and this is the reason that I want people to sort of come in with a blank slate, is this brainstorming technique. It's fairly simple, um, but it's very, very useful when you're trying to just generate ideas and become that idea factory. And when you're targeting a festival, and this is similar to what we did with the Sunshine Festival, is we brainstorm. I didn't particularly do this method, but I have used it um, many other times before. Um, is when you've got your target, come up with as many ideas as you can, and then sort of this method will help you identify the most suitable film to make. And I'll share screen now. Usually I would do this on a big whiteboard or a big piece of paper, which we can't do today. So I've sort of tried to simulate that um, in a Word document. So what I would normally do is I've got my whiteboard, I've got my big piece of paper, and I've put in three categories up the top. Now the first category is what the festival is looking for. Um, and I've just been environmental comedy as well. We know those other restrictions, comedy and less than five minutes. So we'll keep those in mind. Um, the second thing to consider is you'd call it achievability or how, how doable it is. Um, and we've got two actors and we've got no gear. So we, we're just gonna keep that in mind as well. And the third is, do I like it? Um, we're all gonna have to agree on what we like here, which may be fun. But when you do this yourself, it, it's something that um, you're, passionate about, you know, something that, that you're really interested in and passionate to make. So when we come up with our ideas, we're going to sort of run them through all of these filters and give them a score to determine um, what is the, the best way to proceed. And when you do, it sort of forces you to really think about the idea before you get started, before you even start scripting. Um, to, it'll stop you hitting any hurdles, you know, you, especially the achievability one. Um, you go, you step back and think about, okay, what's it actually going to take to produce this idea? And you'll quickly realize that some ideas uh, may just be a bit of a headache. Um, and there are often those sort of hurdles that stop you getting started in the first place. You know, when we made our film, all we had to do is go down to the costume stop shop and buy a vampire outfit. Whereas, you know, if you've written in, a, I don't know, a police car or something, it's just, you, you go, okay, set out to try and do it, but you're just going to keep putting it off, putting it off, put it off and never get it done. So first of all, list, list, list your three categories at the top and don't worry, the funny will come. <clears throat> the next stage I would do is brainstorm just a whole bunch of ideas. And I don't mean ideas for films, I just mean words. And things to do with these categories. So think different genres, think those, what are those different things you can access, think, uh, you know, characters, um, other films and TV shows, storytelling devices. So um, an example of that is from our film is the, the device of someone telling a story and it's being reenacted. It's been done a million times before. And more specifically, the, the, the reenacting actor being voiced by the person telling the story. That's just something that we've seen a million times. I don't know if anyone's seen Drunk History. We just borrowed that device, you know? Um, there's so many storytelling devices that will inspire great ideas. Um, and also topics that are relevant to the theme. And so that's what I've done. I've sort of just listed one of each. I've just listed horror. I know that the film we made is horror. I promise I'm not a one trick pony, but I've, I've put horror for now. Um, I said, uh, Doug has an old pirate costume line about, so he's, he's listed that there. Um, I watched the, the trailer for Bill and Ted last night and 
so I've written that down. But this does not mean we're going to make a film about Bill and Ted. I've just put in brackets time travelers because that's the idea it's going to be inspiring as well. Tiger King's a TV show that was on recently. The device that I've listed is piece to camera mockumentary, a show like The Office. Like, you know, that's another common device that is commonly used. Um, and then I've got three things that are something to do with the environmental topics. I've just written global warming, ocean plastic recycling. So usually when I'm doing this, I'm feeling like 50 different ideas like this. I've just written a few here, um, but I'll just, I'll go nuts. Okay. So once you've sort of spread that all out on your page, the next step is to then add a spin to the ball is to think about these ideas and think of a way to add a fresh take on that idea that also fits the checkbox that you're trying to tick. So for the, the first five there, environmental has nothing to do with these. So obviously that unique spin we're gonna put on it has something to do with that theme. So I've just gone through and added thought about what if I did combine environmental with some of these ideas, what could it look like? And don't worry about any of that, these ideas being terrible. Some of these ideas listed here are pretty bad. Maybe they're not, maybe you'll see something in them. Um, so I thought, you know, like uh, sort of, no one really discusses polar bears in global warming anymore, but um, I thought, you know, just be funny, like the, the, the angry polar bear who's, uh, whose ice caps are melted and turning that into a horror film. Um, trying to tell someone that you've decided to become a pirate because of rising sea levels. Um, a future warning to your past self about uh, the environment or whatever. Uh, that's a terrible idea. I just put Tiger Lily King because I know Tiger Lily is a plant. <laughs> um, the piece of camera mockumentary sort of made me think, you know, who could you interview? And I thought, oh, it would be funny if you interviewed a chemical, like if you interviewed CO2, if you personified that, well, that could be an interesting take on it. And then with the bottom three, I've gotten those from somewhere else. So I like the personification thing. So I've drawn an arrow there. Um, I could, thought I could do a similar thing with planets. Um, I've borrowed the horror thing down to ocean plastics, and then I've just come up with a, a standalone idea for recycling. So do this. And if you've got 50 ideas on a page, you should then suddenly have 50 different uh, creative spins on those words or ideas that you've come up with. Um, am I cool to keep going, Ra? We're all sweet. Sweet. So we've just got some ideas down. The next thing we're going to do is score them. So I'm going to, each of those ideas, now some of those I was more excited about before I put it through these filters, um, but then putting through the filters can really help you sort of pick which one is the most sensible to proceed with. Um, for example, with the, the polar bears, I said, yeah, okay, it's, it's sort of environmental, polar bears, not really too much to do with, with the um, environmental and global warming movement at the moment. So there's like a three, but this one, two, it's like, I'm gonna have to get a polar bear outfit. So stuff that. Um, but I did like the idea. I thought it was sort of cute. Um, and so you add all this together, I got a nine. I've rated these out of five, by the way. Um, it's an arbitrary number, but rate them out of however you like. Um, so I've gone ahead and done that to all of them. And obviously everyone's gonna be different. Like scoring these things is gonna be quite subjective as well. So um, everyone's gonna look a little bit different to everyone else's. Um, but then I identified that that's probably the one for me. Like I thought it was, most topical. I thought it was quite fresh as well. You know, I, I liked it somewhat and it's pretty achievable. Like if you're just trying to personify a chemical as a person, you can just write CO2 on a piece of paper and stick it to their chest. Um, and then the, the PTC mockumentary is a very, very easy thing to, to accomplish as well. Um, so that's sort of me basically running through how I approach brainstorming these ideas. Um, but because we don't have the big whiteboard. It's very difficult for me to do it this way. I'm just gonna do it another way for today's exercise. Now I've gone through a whole bunch of my ideas there, but now I want to throw it out to everyone else and have them come up with some ideas. So Doug, we're still gonna do the same thing. Doug is entering an environmental film festival. Uh, it's comedy, it's gotta be funny and uh, has to be less than five minutes. So no three hour epics from anyone. So if people have any ideas, now remember we start from, we're not starting from ideas 
for a short film. We're just starting from those things like the genre and the things you have access to, characters in, in, in other films and TV shows. So I'm going to go back to the document and people will start sending through your questions and I want to see what sort of words and ideas you can come up with. Do you have any, Ra? What comes to the top of your head? So is, is it still the horror? So Sorry, are we asking to... Can be anything. So I want to demonstrate that it can be anything and I want to show you that anything you put down, how that can then transfer into an idea. So um, I actually don't want you to do horror because I did horror in that example, but give me a different genre. Mm -hmm. Romantic comedy. Rom-com, great. All right. We're just going to do 10. So first in best dressed. Come on, guys. Genre. It doesn't have to be genre. It can be like what is something you have access to. Think about a prop you have, all right? What a character from a film. It could be a specific character. You could say Spider-Man. It doesn't matter. A TV show. Sure. So just throw any of those things at you. Anything. anything. Okay. We've got my couch. Is that someone called Mike Ouch? Or, or a Mike couch, Ouch? I'm guessing. I'm guessing we're talking about furniture here. My couch? Great. <laughs> um, we've got 90s, 50s costumes. 1950s. Costumes, yep. We've got kombucha. <laughs> Very topical, <laughs> okay. Um, now, now you're testing my spelling. I have no idea how to spell that. Okay. Um, okay. Is it double M? No, just Bush. one M. B U. -C yeah, you got it. Um, we've got musical instruments here, I'll, and I'm going to choose sax. The good old saxophone. Saxophone. Okay. <laughs> and also, when we do these, like exactly what you did then, Ra, like you know. We may write down saxophone, but we may be inspired to then tangent off into something that involves a guitar or whatever. Like that is totally fine. This is just to, to generate random words. I can spell kombucha, but I, apparently I can't spell saxophone. That's embarrassing. <laughs> saxophone. Yeah. Doesn't make sense. You don't call it a saxophone. Anyway, I'll have that argument with English later. I've got here um, water restrictions. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So that is great. That's targeting the environmental topic. Mm -hmm. I'll look at my other window. I'm just going to stand here in silence until you, you all come up with another floor. Native flora and fauna. Um, so I'm going to pick some sturt and Sturt Desert Pea. Is that what it is? A what? I've never heard of that. A Sturt Desert Pea is no... Come and back me. Isn't it like a normal state flower? Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep it broad for now. And then once we do our spin, if that pea plant that you mentioned inspires anything, we'll go with that. <laughs> uh, we have food waste. Food waste. Good. Oh, this is cute. We've got a dying herb garden. Dying herb garden? Mm. Sure. I've experienced that myself. Coriander is impossible to grow. One more. One more, guys. Um, it's good. It gives me a water break. <laughs> I've got here fluffy towels. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's our random 10 things. Okay, so then um, our next step. Now, again, normally when I do this, I'm normally doing it on a big page and I'd have all these words going anywhere. So you sort of have to view them like that and think about, um, I think sometimes the obvious step is, is thinking what two things can go together. You know, if I, what does rom-com mixed with food waste look like, okay? Um, but also just think about, what are some other spins that we can do to make any of the, these ideas usable? So any of these ones that I'm bolding, uh, mm -hmm. I would say 
need an environmental flavor to them. And we going to spawn herb garden. So food waste, food waste and water restrictions already tick that in environmental box. So we, we would be um, trying to add another idea to those, but the others we can sort of put through the environmental filter to try and come up with an idea. So let's first start with uh, rom-com. I think that's a great idea for a genre suggestion. So remember, we're trying to make these funny. So what is, I'm mean, again, throwing it out to everyone else. What is uh, a spin that we can add to a rom-com to make it uh, an environmental idea? There's no wrong answers. And um, we might even list a few if there's a few good suggestions. But as I'm talking, guys, just please like suggest a way. So how can we position a rom-com to also tick the environmental box? Mm, mm, you might have to really think outside the box of this one. Mm. So rom-com. Romance between two people. So ask yourself, who are those two people? We've got um, and a suggestion of dating someone chained to a tree. So maybe one of the part, one of the people of chained okay, nice. to a tree. Uh, what do you call those? Oh, let's just call them a tree hugger or tree. Uh, no, I think that specifically the uh, Right, as we said, a person chained to tree. That's really funny. Like, imagine you know, um, breaking up with someone because they're they're always chained to a tree. I think that's just like a, a funny premise. That's great. Um, any others? What else we got for rom com? I think someone suggested here. Um, oh, they combined a rom the rom com genre combined with another idea already listed, which is the water restrictions. Um, so I think they said romance blooms from sharing a shower or, or, and it could be the opposite a fight about water restrictions, I guess. Um, but that's a suggestion oh, yeah. to combine the two of the existing ideas. So it'd be like domestic drama argument or a yeah. why can't I spell today? Oh my God. Um, or like romance of water restrictions. <laughs> I'm trying to think how that could play out. So people like forced to, to share the shower or, or something, I guess was the idea. Cool. So now let's make it a free for all. If there's anything there that inspires any comedic ideas, I might add them as well as we go. Ra, please. Feel free to suggest anything as well. Here, Let's fill this up. Cafe and cafe workers. I'm not sure if that's in response to the rom com or the environmental, or maybe it's just maybe it's just an offer for um, characters. Um, and we've got. I'm not sure with that one. Uh, we have no flowers for Valentine's Day. Mm. So, <laughs> Uh, that's good. I wonder if they mean that for the, for the, for the hmm. well, I think for the rom-com, I'm speaking oh, of course, yeah, yeah. For half of people, but I'm thinking yes, of course friction that might cause. Yeah. It's like, I mean, that's a, that's a, a funny premise for a short, definitely it's like trying to, um, I'll just come off share screen for the moment. Um, oh wait, am I still on the share screen? No, I've stopped. No, no, you're not. Oh, sorry. Um, I've been writing these down. So yeah, the, the no flowers for Valentine's Day, often with um, short film, you can follow a, another similar thing and I'll explain this soon, which is with sketches to sort of exaggerate the premise um, is a really good sort of thing to do with sketches. Like you offer up an absurd idea and then you always raise the absurdity. You know, you, you exaggerate the premise again and then again and again. And so like no flowers for Valentine's Day could be that. It's like, what does Valentine's Day look like in a future where the environment's been ruined? So, you know, the, the first image is, is walking up with a bunch of like dead stems or dead roses or something like that. But then, you know, I don't know, what, what are some other things Valentine's Day that people might expect that they're not getting? Like, uh, you know, they go on a romantic walk, but oh no, wait, sorry, the streets are flooded again. 
or you know whatever comes to mind so that's a really good one in terms of building it into an absurdist comedy i think we have a suggestion here of a romance with a mermaid <laughs> which is yeah. there's a lot of um they can't move in because of water restrictions ah okay nice mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm still here <laughs> The, the kombucha is really getting me. That's a, that's a bit of a curveball. Um, here, what have we got? Um, how to cut costs at the kombucha factory. And costs for environmental purposes, possibly. Could that be... Trying to make that it with an environmental message, I'm not sure. I think that's something we always have to keep in the back of our mind. If this fake festival is always looking for a, a positive environmental message, mm. I think that the the thing you'd want to do is is really hit the obvious. Um, so like 1950s costumes, for me, I think that's a good one. Um, I think the obvious there would be, you know, a comparative. What does being environmentally conscious? What did it mean in in the 1950s? You know, like someone's going back in time to deliver a message or um, you could sort of parody how poor people's attitudes were at that point in time. You know, so I think there's a few good ones for that one. So I won't drag this out too long, but it's just an example exercise. So I'm going to move on very shortly, guys. So if you've got any other ideas, please get them in. Being being arrested for killing your herb garden. What is that? The is a, it's a, okay. So uh, like police or <laughs> I mean the, the herb garden. I mean that could. I mean I I like I think that's a quite a good idea because if you're talking about being arrested for killing uh, a herb garden, we're talking about. Um, an exaggeration, but an exaggeration on on what? And so, you know, the, the message for me for that one in terms of being environmental, it's like, you know, you've allowed your herb garden to die and that's fine with you, but so then why are you allowing the planet to die? You know, so that you've got a, a comedic comparison between those two things. So I think that one's, that one's quite good. So... Feel free to list any others, guys, but I'm just going to go through and score these um, as well. Just And we're going to sort of determine which one we really like. Um, so let's see. Dating a person chained to a tree. Environmental. Yes. So I'm going to give that uh, three or a four. Um, is it achievable? Yes. I'll, I'll we'll vote on which ones we like a bit later. So I think it's very achievable. You need to buy a chain and things like that, but it's not too bad. Um, and I like no flowers of Valentine's too. I think that's quite good. Environmental, it's probably more environmental than the other one. And it's achievable, fairly easy to do. And that's also good. Remember our restrictions, guys, we have two actors. So we've got potentially two people who would, would share Valentine's Day um, together so that one's that one's great um which other what other ones do we like i like the being arrested killing herb garden we need access to a herb garden that makes it a little bit difficult to film but it is a, potentially a nice little um analogy for environmentalism uh cost i don't i won't do that one don't quite get that one um Water restrictions, romance of sharing a shower, we've got domestic argument and we've got romance with a mermaid. Um, okay, so romance, shower, water restrictions. To me, water restrictions, I think, um, 
loses a bit of points on the environmental thing because it is more of a, I don't know, like when you hear people talk about water restrictions, it's like a local council issue and not as big. And just from experience in looking through some of these briefs of environmental film festivals, they do like people to sort of talk about big issues. So I think to me personally, you may disagree. It may lose points on getting into that film festival because of that. Um, not saying water restrictions aren't important, but I just think it's um, it sort of lives in the shadow of, of the bigger uh, issues around environmentalism. So I'm going to score them a little bit lower on that. Um, I the shower is very achievable. I'll give it a five. And as a mermaid, you need a mermaid outfit. That's going to be a pain in the butt. So call that a two. I like it. I don't know. Maybe you've got a mermaid outfit on hand. If that's the case, go for it. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to pick those five for now. So of those five, what do we like, guys? Come on, get cast your votes in. What 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 do we like? I mean, I like. I really like no flowers for Valentine's. Um, I really like the mermaid. Mm -hmm. What do you like, Ra? What's your favourite? I think I like simplicity and the achievability of the no flowers for Valentine's and also because I think it's easy to get to the heart of that story very easily. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a simple dilemma and conflict. Yep. All right, if no one else is speaking. Wait, wait, wait. Well, let me have a little look. I just, someone said, yes, I have a mermaid outfit. Great. You can make that. <laughs> it was the same person who suggested it as well, which is great. I mean, that's exactly what you need to be th thinking about. It's like you some things you have access to. Um, and so someone else has voted for the, the no flowers and dating the person chained to. Yeah, th those are, I think those are mine as well. So, um, okay, let, let's take those. Let's. Just, I mean, this is just a hypothetical exercise. So, um, mermaid's just shower, that's not bad. And then mermaid, mermaid's good, I like mermaid. And then being arrested because of herb garden, I don't mind that too. So, what I would then do is go through these and score them. So, you've got, you know, like 13, 14, blah, blah, blah. I won't score them all because this is not a math lesson, but um, I can see that that one, the no flowers of Valentine's would, would win that. Um, and this is when we sort of move on to our next step, which is expanding on those ideas. So um, when, before we expand, you don't have to lock that in. You, you may sort of develop this to a point and realize, oh, wait, I didn't consider this or realize you were more passionate about another idea or another idea has sparked something in you and you really want to follow it. We're not locked into anything, but just, um, for this example, we're going to just run with run with one. And so at the next point that I want to talk about in terms of developing an idea, um, it's really about expanding on that idea. It's still, we're still part of the brainstorm. We haven't locked every detail of this in yet, um, but we're a long way away from scripting it. So out of some of the ideas that you have brainstormed, you'll find that some of them need more development, more brainstorming than others. So something like uh, being arrested for killing a herb garden. I reckon there's, there's quite a few different angles. I mean, it inspired in me before that, you know, the herb garden could be an analogy for the planet, but maybe that's just one angle of where that idea could go. Um, no flowers for Valentine's. I think it's, for me personally, it's a little bit more obvious um, in terms of, where that one's going to go. Um, but you guys might might think of something else um, that that inspires as well within that idea. So basically what I would then do is expand on that idea. So um, no flowers for Valentine's. Is take that idea and it, try and come up with a unique angle on it. Um, in as many different ways as possible. Um, now, as I said, this one is more solidified. So this stage may be less of that and more of 
uh, trying to develop sort of gags and, and visuals for this, you know, like I said before with the flowers and then maybe there's like a, a rising water, like what, what are some other things that this idea inspires? So I want to see how creative people are out there. So is there any um, angles on this we could, that, that inspires in, in you creatively? Is there any gags you can think of? What are, what are some things that jump to mind, that spring to mind? So the dead roses. We've got rising sea levels on a walk. Um, and really like the, the process here is to sort of just get a big bank of, of ideas and to sort of pick the best one. So to develop a whole bunch of different um, options of, of ways we can take our idea and then sort of rate them against each other and sort of pick the best angle. So do we have any ideas coming through? Oh, sorry, you're on mute, Ra. I've got the florist shop has been boarded up. So I guess that's a reason why. Um, so I guess that's someone shop boarded up. I mean, yeah, I mean, that angle to me, I'm not sure what um, that person uh, means by exactly. I'm assuming it could mean if, if you're talking about a future where um, environmental has got so bad that you know, it's devastated the economy and shores of, uh, shores of clothes like that is, yeah, a completely um, logical angle to, to take. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's closed signs across many florist shops. So I think it's more about maybe across the state, maybe Every, all the florist shops are closed. Oh, we've got allergies to the flowers. Um, I think another one I was just thinking could be that it's actually if the partner forgot to get flowers and it's more of an excuse and then it starts yeah. using. That's good. Like then we're in less of a, an absurd world and we're dealing now with more of an absurd character where like, are, are you suggesting so it's like the guy's come home, he, he hasn't brought any flowers and he's trying to, his excuse for it is, oh, you know, global warming, there's, there's no yeah. flowers left. Right, yeah, so like a pathetic cover-up, that's great. Yeah, and he has to keep committing to that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, did you forget it's Valentine's Day? Well, you know, it's, there's less oxygen in the world now because of CO2 and when that happens, like that, that affects memory, you know, like, yeah, um, that's great. Um, one that occurred to me was maybe um, the no flowers, you know, so like, don't be afraid to sort of tangent a bit. Like if you're, when you're brainstorming, don't be afraid if that inspires a thought to go down that path. So one for me was sort of, rather than having no flowers, what could be in place of the flowers? So in a world um, where we've been environmentally devastated, what would be the Valentine's equivalent of a box of chocolates and flowers? You know, is it a canister of air? Is it, you know, like just what silly, absurd things could be in place of gifts in the future? Mm -hmm. So I'll just put down future gifts. So just so we're not running out of time, um, you would fill that up, fill that up with, um, more and then I would do sort of like a similar process. So which which one of these are more achievable? Which one do you think sort of delivers the message? Which one is going to be funniest? And which one you know makes you really want to make this film? Um, and yeah, just by doing this, you are picking the the I think is a really good way to sort of pick the best film to make for that festival. Um, yeah, so. This is what worked uh, for us when we did the last one. Um, went through a lot of ideas and said, this is the best one for us and it makes sense to do. So we're gonna make that one. So, and it's also just a really good way to exercise um, that creative muscle. Because like, if you wanna be a writer, you should be 
doing this stuff all the time. Like uh, in, in my writing team at the moment, like every day we're just coming up with ideas and the two writers that I work with are absolute guns at it because they've, ge they've generated so much comedy before that to them it's just second nature. And for those of you who, who are maybe partaking that exercise, um, just suggesting things, some of you might have been sitting there thinking, oh man, I can't think anything funny and you know, this isn't working. Like, don't worry about it. Like the more you practice coming up with silly, funny ideas, the better you'll get at it. Um, so that is sort of just that brainstorming exercise in a nutshell, um, a demonstration. Uh, before we wrap up, I'll quickly move on to the, the next segment, which is about um, sort of writing funny and some tips and tricks for that. But before I move on, is there any sort of last minute questions or, or anything like that? I'll just give one second to see if there's anyone has any questions on that section. No worries. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, here we here's the question. Um, what do you think is the easiest mistake to fix when planning out a short? Just trying to. Oh, what do you think? Mm -hmm. is that? Easiest mistake to happen? I'm not sure, but easiest mistake to fix. Oh, um, yeah, I'm not sure, quite sure what they mean. If they mean like, you know, what are some, if you come across mistakes, what are, what's the easiest way to fix those mistakes? I mean, is that what they mean maybe? I'll go to the next question and if that wants to maybe follow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, already follow up. Um, sorry. What's the most common mistake when planning out a short? Um, uh, I don't think there is a common mistake. I mean, without thinking of my own films, right. It's always a different mistake. You know, it's like my first, I mean, my first film, I'm, I'm teased by my friends a lot for casting a particular actor. It's like, why did you cast him? He was the worst, like he was the worst actor because we used to have school auditions um, and all, like all these actors would come in and uh, yeah, we'd sort of, you know, chat to him and stuff and, and cast him in our films. And so there was this sort of acting showroom that we'd access and some people were really good and some people were awful. And I just picked just the worst actor and I'm still made fun of that today. You know, um, but in other films I've made, it, it's other things. It's like, you know, I just haven't understood script enough. Um, hasn't been funny enough. Like it's, you know, my, my editing skills went up to scratch or whatever. So yeah, I don't think there's, there's any obvious things. I think it's more just to be mindful that there are so many factors that go into making a good film and that you should be a, a student of all those areas. You know, like it's learn how to be a good writer, a good director, learn good camera work, you know, learn everything. Um, and another question is, um, if they already have an idea for a short film, do you recommend using this same process to brainstorm the premise? It's, uh, it's so part of the reason why I said, put your ideas on ice is is to sort of like encourage you to look and I, I have no idea what your idea is. It could be amazing. Um, but just from uh, a lot of this comes from personal experience is that it's to get away from your own ego a bit and get around, away from your own love of your own idea because we all love the things we create and it's very, very hard to look at them from someone else's perspective. You know, I could pitch you an idea that I think is the best and you all go, Oh yeah. You know, it's, it, it, we view our own ideas very differently to the, the way an audience views our ideas. And if your idea, if you think it is that good, maybe, you know, have you had that sort of introspection? Have you looked at yourself and gone, okay, this film deserves me to be better before I make it, you know, perhaps it is one to save, you know, um, become an idea factory. Like just, just because you have one idea doesn't mean you can can't come up with another great hundred ideas you know right. Right. so I'll, I'll probably 
move on. If you've got any other questions, save them. I'll try and get them through to the end. So the we've only got about ooh, less than 15 minutes. So I wanted to sort of talk about um, writing funny, but this isn't, an hour and a half is not enough time to sort of teach, you know, gag writing principles and these sort of things. So this is more just me talking about a way to approach writing and giving you some resources and things like that. So there is so many, with comedy writing, um, comedy writing is, I view it as a science. I view it as sort of like, it's for me, it's very patent based. It's very mathematical and it's an applied science. So the, there's a lot of people out there who have try to figure it out and they come up with their own rules and they're they all there's a lot of overlap and they all sort of cover the same territory so you know i've used a certain school of comedy but there's so many other ones out there as well so i'll just share with you three so the one that i learned i was at rmit i learned tim ferguson's uh cheeky monkey and especially if you're interested in writing narrative and understanding understanding character if you're doing longer form comedy, understanding character is absolutely vital. Um, and another one is the Comedy Bible. Both of these books are, are very broad, so you can use it for stand up, for short films, for sitcoms, for movies. Um, the Comedy Bible is a bit more gag based. Um, and if you're wanting to use something that you can access right now, um, there's something called the Funny Filters, the creator of the Onion. So if you just Google Funny Filters, the Onion, you'll see. Um, some articles that sort of demonstrate how it works. Um, and I can actually share, I think, the doc, which is waste too much time, share file. I have a Word doc of this. And this is just something that you can use right now. It's actually a really good one to use with that brainstorming process when you just have an idea. Um, you run it through these sort of funny filters um, to come up with funny ideas so funny exercises open and it doesn't work okay i'm not going to waste time trying to get that to work so but if you just google it you'll, you'll find it there it does exist it's very very easy to use it's sort of 11 filters that you put it through um to help you generate jokes it's a really really good resource um and a really simple one where you don't have to read like you know, this novel of a book um cool so what was up to next all right, next, I wanna say something that's really, really controversial where writers, maybe even you Ra, might be really annoyed and disagree with me, but I'm gonna say it anyway. This is my personal opinion, but I'm not even sharing the screen. There's no such thing as writer's block, only bad planning. <laughs> Um, I don't think writer's block exists. And I, look, there's some screenwriters that I really respect who, who think it does. Um, for me, I don't understand that if you plan what you're writing to the nth degree, how you could possibly hit a wall. Now I understand writer's block in terms of like, oh, I can't think of a name for this character or I'm struggling to think of a funny thing they could say here. But in terms of, Getting blocked in your narrative, I don't get that. Um, because, so I, I've learned screenwriting and um, I think comedy is, is best approached in a very structural manner. Like you would never just start writing a script. I always sort of approach it in a, in a three act structure um, approach. Um, so I'm just gonna share screen again. I, I'm not gonna go too much in three act structure. I'm just sort of going over it to, um, cause everyone probably knows it. So when I'm doing um, anything, any if I'm writing a book or a short film or a TV pilot or whatever, I'm always plugging it into three act structure and thinking about beats. If you if you're reading um, uh, Tim Ferguson's book, his looks slightly different to this. He's his is a has a resolution and a true resolution, which is a really good um, trick to use when writing narrative comedy. Um, this is mine. So if I was to look at the Stereo Vampire. This is how it's plotted out. Stereo Vampire is not the best um, way, sorry, the best example um, when looking at these because it has sort of these two strange narratives running side by side, which is the story world and the filmmaker's world. So it gets a bit, it's sort of, it's a bit subver subversive in a way. So, but I would always think about 
writing comedy, especially short in this way, especially the hook. You know, there's nothing worse when you cut to, you know, like it's a drama short of a desert and like there's some guy in a cowboy hat and he's thinking with a VO and he's talking poetry. What the hell is he talking about? We had a cute girl in a chair who says, I'm going to tell you a ghost story. Immediately your audience is hooked. Like, oh my God, she's adorable. I'm in. Um, and then, you know, there's a problem, the inciting incident. There's a turning point. He's not a, a threat. He, he's actually there to drink blood from the fridge. They become friends halfway through. And then our weird turning point is the filmmakers lose control of the film, which is that Elvie starts doing her own thing. Then she does a bit more. Um, and then the climax is that she gets back on trap track. She becomes friends with the vampire, but then decides to kill him all of a sudden. Um, and then the resolution, why did she kill him? Because he's a vampire. So I would approach structuring anything like this. Structure your eight beats of the three structure. If you've never heard of this before, go look it up. Um, and then beyond that, if, you, if you're talking about scenes, do the same thing for scenes. Scenes, I would break down in the same way. If you've got an unfunny scene, um, one reason for that is it might be lacking conflict. Structure it like a three act structure. Structure it like a, a story within the story. Um, I'm trying to sort of speed up now so we can have some questions at the end. Um, another really, really good resource for structuring comedy if you do a YouTube search for writing advice from the creators of South Park. So just do a search for writing advice from Matt Stone and Trey Parker. It goes for two minutes, and that two minutes. Change your life. No, it won't. But, um, it's a really, really good resource. It's they talk about sort of the cause and effect of comedy. That comedy is not it, it best works when it's not this happens and this happens and this happens, but there's because something happened, the next thing happens and everything sort of flows on from each other. It's all about cause and effect. So look that up, it's really good. They'll um describe it much better than I have. Um and then when it comes to sort of dialogue and uh gags and, and things like that. There's something that I was doing in that brainstorm session, which is something I was taught many years ago called the, the rule of 10. And I use it for everything. Basically, it's the idea that you come up with as many ideas for the one thing and pick the best one. Um, again, it's an arbitrary number. You can do the rule of 100 if you like. But if you're trying to title a film, if you're trying to think of a piece of dialogue you can't get quite right, write it 10 times, right? And then pick the best one. Or if you're not sure, write it. 10 times, 20 times, show someone else, which one of these do you like? Or which, which do you find this funnier or this funnier? Um, again, it's just going to exercise that creative muscle of, your, of yours as well. You know, so it's just a good practice to get into. Um, now, the other thing in this last five minutes, I'll try and quickly go over is um, the idea of, you would have heard the, the quote of that a, a film is written three times is really embrace this, that, um, it really is like when you're writing your own comedy script, never feel like it's locked in. You should empower the people who are performing in it, the ones who are editing it to have creative control. There's, if you look at any, look at any behind the scenes of a major comedy Hollywood film made now, you always see bloopers and things where you, you can tell that they've tried so many different jokes live on set, you know, and when you use good comic performers, they understand this. And they will inject their own sort of sense of humor into it. You know, a show like Curb Your Enthusiasm doesn't have a script. It's a retro script. They just have in point, out point. Let's just improvise our way through it. Um, you know, so the story's mapped, but the jokes aren't there. Um, they just fill it with really good comedy performers. So when you're comedy scripting, I always see this almost like a, a, a template. You know, this is, this is our story. Here's a whole bunch of gags we can use. But if you work with really good um, comedic performers, they're going to outdo you in comedy a lot of the time. And often when you get on set and you say it out loud with another person, you sort of realize, you know what, it would be funnier if we said this instead or did it in this way and that sort of thing. Um, and the same is true of the edit. There's a big difference between a good editor and a good comedy editor. Um, and a good comedy editor can make comedy almost out of nothing where you didn't intend there to be a gag. But I think where the editing is, most important is with um, comedy pacing, you know, so that gives you control 
over the timing, the comedic timing of the film, because learning comedic timing is uh, very, very hard to do. Uh, it takes a long time, you know, of doing performing, doing stand up, or, or, or acting a lot. Um, but with an edit, uh, you can you suddenly have control over that. So if someone's not good at comedic timing on set, you can control it in the edit. And so plan for that as well. You know, if you've got coverage where you've got a lot of singles of people and you plan that in advance where they leave a lot of airtime between their lines, it gives your editor a chance to just sort of change the speed and the timing and the pacing of the film. You know, whereas if you sort of just cover everything in a big wide shot and you're just going to get four comedians leaning on a wall, but they're not seasoned, the pacing will be all over the place. So um, yeah, it's just sort of something to be mindful of there. Um, and like we, we had, actually, do you know what? I won't go into our examples. I was going to reference the Stereo Vampire again um, of just some examples of exactly that working in the script, but I might just leave it. Um, yeah, so I do have some other things to talk about, but I've only got a few minutes left, so I thought we might quickly open up some other questions. Yeah. Well, um, put it to the floor. Does anyone have any burning questions for Adam before we go? Um, it can be general um, advice about comedy writing or specifically to something you're working on. Um, a question about um, Starry Vampire. Um, well, did Adam, did you want to just do your um, anecdote about Starry yeah, what, Vampire? Yeah, so, or, you know. Um, as Phil, just send some questions through, otherwise I'll just keep talking. Uh, interrupt me with your questions, please. Um, it was just on that point of allowing yourself to be flexible um, on set and in the edit. So in the Starry Vampire, there's a scene where uh, me as, as the vampire um, has sunscreen put on his face and, and I scripted that, that she was just wiped on his face. And then Dan, he was shooting, it's behind the camera and he just goes, what if we have her like squirt it in your face, like from the bottle? She just like hits it and splats all over your face. And I just went, yes, we're doing that. Um, and it was so hard to do because we had to do it in just one take because I had purple oil on my face and we couldn't reset. Um, so I had to somehow do it without flinching and then repeat a line. But I think Dan just wanted to do it for his own amusement. But, you know, it's, it's being that flexible. It's like letting people come up with ideas on the fly and sort of going, yeah, that's going to work great. And in, in the edit, it was the same thing. So we were in a lucky position where we were sort of editing at the same time we were filming and writing it. We were sort of just throwing it all together. And when LV, the little girl, starts like kicking the microphone or pretending to be a frog or this sort of stuff, um, that was real. Like she just got distracted and started doing random things. And we edited that into the film and then went and shot other stuff for it to work. Yeah. I just have um, um, two quick questions. Um, favorite, if you have any favorite comedy editors, I guess that's people that you've worked with. Or, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, there's a really good editor that we sometimes get in uh, called Scott. Burgess at the ABC and he's a gun like I'm always I love how we, we would sort of send him an episode or something and he's just added gags into it and I'm like how did you do that that's amazing but he's someone who really gets gets comedy I mean you know like this and last one um any other resources um, you've mentioned those two great books and those online ones but anything else um in regards to understanding beats and scenes if you're um, pretty new to writing or haven't had formal training? Well, I think anything um, in terms of structure, oh, what's it called? It's called um, uh, the one with the cat. Does anyone know it? What's the screenwriting book with the cat? Save, uh, save the cat or whatever. Save the cat. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I think it's just to understand screenwriting structure in general. Um, and then those books I suggested uh more specifically about comedy and and comedy genres and that sort of thing. Um, Tim's is great for that, um, especially like comedy in narrative form. It all comes from characters, especially in longer form comedy. And it's really important to understand that first, you know, so your comedies, your, sorry, your characters will drive the narrative of your story 
Um, and so it's really important to understand how comedic characters work. Um, yeah, so I, I would recommend that book again, but is any book that's about like Save the Cat, that is about film structure in general. Yeah. Right, right. Well, it's 5.31, so I'm just gonna say some closing words. Um, thank you to St Kilda Film Festival and all the festival sponsors and to Cine Space and the Sunshine Short Film Festival. To find out more about Cine Space or the Sunshine for Short Film Festival, please go to Cine Space, which is C-I-N-E-S-P-A-C-E dot org dot au or sunshinefilmfestival.com.au and to encourage people to go the distance and make your film the kind people at sunshine short film festival are offering to help with the development of your scripts to anyone who registered and is attending this live workshop you can send your short film script or pitch documents to admin at sunshinefilmfestival.com.au Please note it must be five pages or less and they will provide you with a one page readers report. Thank you everyone who joined us today and for all your great questions. And lastly, a big thank you to Adam. Thank you for being- Grace, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for being generous with your time and all your knowledge. And no everyone again, and I hope you all got a lot out of this workshop and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks, Adam. No worries. Thanks you all for joining. I notice there's about 57 people online. So if I don't see 57 hilarious comedy films at the next Lunch and Film Festival, I'm going to be very disappointed. <laughs> oh, you so and make stuff. Make stuff, guys. Do it. Do it tomorrow. Thanks. Bye, everyone.